David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Friday. It's it's May thirteenth, Friday the thirteenth. I would play the horror dramatic music. I'll do it later because if I do it now, there won't be this uh, rhythmic thrumming in the background, which is very important to our beginning of our show uh, for reasons. It really does sound strange and disconcerting if you just accidentally stop it in the middle. So we won't. How about that? Instead, we will proceed with the show. Plenty of things happening. Um, Not all of them bad luck, but uh, many of them portents of bad luck. Anyway, the Kegger in the Morning radio show is live now. This is from Bill's Morning Tweet, never a portent of bad luck. Kegger X reminds you, that's me, hi, that today is Friday the 13th. I'm going to go to the bad luck thing anyway. So, it's a good time to activate the cloaking device on your Apple Watch. I didn't even know I had that. In other news, Apple Watch cloaking device to be unveiled in 2023. Okay, well, you'll have to wait. So, But you can activate it. If you activate it now, I suppose when it comes online, it'll be ready. I don't know if that's a recommended course of action. You'll like disappear in the middle of something important. But uh, <clears throat> I guess for those of you ready and willing to be able to disappear, uh, you can warn your family and friends about it now. At this point, perhaps next year, depending on how long it takes to roll it out once it's introduced, etc. Supply chain shortages being what they are, etc. Uh, you know, I could disappear at any moment. All right, let's see. Other things that we need to catch up on. Everything in the world. All right, so our task is ahead of us. Uh Not so easy, but uh, many things that we might uh, interest you in. First of all, I suppose I want to address right off the bat uh, the subpoenas have having been issued by the January 6th committee for sitting members of Congress. This is, uh, well, it's said to be unprecedented and uh, I don't know, it's somehow... uh, Well, it isn't. I don't know. I don't want to. Why bother searching for words? It's not unprecedented. I am reminded by our Twitter pal, uh, NYC Southpaw, that uh, the Congress does, with some frequency, subpoena its own members for testimony before committees of the House. Most often, that is to compel their testimony before the Ethics Committee, which is someplace that they generally don't want to go and and uh, testify anyway, but but everybody recognizes the ability, the right, the power of the Ethics Committee to do that for whatever reason, and they have kind of always at least lived with the idea that if you don't comply with the subpoena, you could be in trouble. Um, maybe that's because it's in the ethics context, and generally speaking, members, you know, even Republican members, up to recently when there were real Republicans and they sort of felt like they had some sort of personal responsibility. Remember when they were the party of personal responsibility like a year ago or whatever? Not really. I mean, it's been a while. But even so, uh, when they were back when they were the party of personal responsibility, when someone got in ethics trouble, it was easy enough for them to say, well, that's not me. I'm not doing that. I mean, they were lying to themselves. They were doing that, but I haven't been caught. That's not me. It's that other schmuck, and he got caught, and quite frankly, getting caught is the bigger crime. He should go face the ethics committee, and they just basically figure this won't happen to them, even though in most cases it's only just a matter of time until it does. Uh, But there was a certain amount back in the day when they had this stuff of shame that was attached to, uh, to uh, to having found yourself in front of the ethics committee and being subpoenaed by it. And so they left people out to dry on their own. You know, it didn't matter. Now, here we find the January 6th committee. There are many members of Congress being subpoenaed and many more who probably could be subpoenaed. And there is, of course, well, there's an entire movement, an entire 
sub-caucus within the Republican conference that could and should be subpoenaed for their activities on and related to January 6th. And so they they see a more widespread danger. And of course, they've been rallying the troops against the legitimacy of the January 6th committee for its entire existence. So it's a little easier for them to step out and say somehow that these subpoenas are invalid. And then, you know, it's a short leap from there to say, well, all subpoenas to all members of Congress from members of Congress are unprecedented. It's never been done before. And everybody forgets about the routine subpoenas that are used by the Ethics Committee. Um, more to the point, though, or at least more to the point that I was talking about yesterday. Uh, this has generated a lot of discussion, um, and we've made a lot of progress in terms of people coming to understand the contempt of Congress procedure, which is good, except, of course, most people still only understand the statutory contempt of Congress procedure, which is also okay because that's the one that you've seen play out before your eyes. A few people, mm, through uh, largely through my own efforts, and then later efforts of other, uh, or well, not other, but uh, actual journalists, I'm not one, uh, they've uh, <clears throat> come to understand at least the concept or the existence of the concept of inherent contempt. But for whatever reason, everybody has forgotten about it so far during this discussion about these subpoenas. Uh, so let's see. I have uh, some, I probably put, I probably, I don't even know if I did put anything aside about who got subpoenaed. Um, that's like actually less important to me than some of the other stuff surrounding the subpoenas. But it, it turns out, uh, what, Jim Jordan, um, Kevin McCarthy, I think they might have included Marjorie Trader Green in this round. They left Lauren Boebert out. They left uh, Gosar out. Um, I think they might have subpoenaed Andy Biggs. Uh, at any rate, it, it's, it's almost beside the point what uh, or who got subpoenaed. Anyway, so the uh, the discussion then became, um, well, whether or not the subpoenas would be enforced. Because, of course, the Republicans immediately said, well, we're just not going to honor the subpoenas and, and, and we won't testify. And everybody fell back on the statutory contempt uh, procedure because that's the one we've seen used fairly frequently. But more, more interesting than that, I thought, were people who were falling back immediately, sometimes in actual defense of the Republicans involved, others uh, just sort of cynically noting that Republicans are likely to object to and refuse to comply with the subpoenas and that they would uh, throw all sorts of excuses in the way. And uh, as usual, most of the excuses don't actually fly, but it doesn't matter because they will use them to uh, delay and clog up the court system anyway. But um, lots of people jumping out and saying, well, uh, in many cases, these members are being called into uh, the committee to answer questions about things that they said on the House floor during the debates about, you know, the so-called debates about the validity of various states' electoral votes and uh, the validity of what was going on outside and the, uh, 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 that is to say, their support for the insurrection, both in the days prior to January 6th and on the day and then afterwards as well. Uh, so to the extent that they're going to be asked questions about things that they said during official debate in the House or in the joint session, uh, lots of people noting that they had available to them the defense, usually anyway, the defense of the speech and debate clause of the Constitution, which holds that uh, members of Congress essentially won't uh, have to face questioning and official sanction, punishment, essentially, of any kind, but to begin with, questioning about things that they say in the course of routine debate. And it's a, you know, it's a fine protection that uh, the founders set up in place, basically to make sure that you couldn't criminalize certain political views and that there would be, believe it or not, one safe space <laughs> in which you could express those opinions if you could manage to get, you know, the consent of the 
the, those being governed in your congressional district to send you as the delegate, uh, as their representative to Congress, that you had the ability to express these things freely without fear of reprisal from the government. But as usual, they didn't finish reading the entire speech and debate clause. Uh, but the, So the defense, the idea that you can't be questioned for the things you said on the House floor about the uh, about January 6th is, again, comes from our routine, I guess our understanding of experience. Because usually it is someone in the executive branch, uh, whether it's the FBI or whatever, the, you know, some police force, bringing you before the Article Three courts, the federal courts, on what you know, with whatever question looms over you, your guilt or innocence based on something that you said on the House floor, and then you assert the speech and debate clause, and they say, ah, this, uh, this in fact uh, immunizes you from having to answer those questions. It doesn't actually immunize you necessarily from prosecution. Uh, they can certainly prove their case with evidence from outside of speeches that you make official uh, speeches on the House floor, or they could say anywhere in the country, I suppose, or anywhere in the world, so long as it was in the pursuit of your official duties, if you read the clause expansively. The problem is, uh, as I mentioned, there's more words in the clause. And the clause kind of concludes this way, that basically uh, you, the, the members shall, be, um, shall not be subject to questioning um, on the subject of their speech and debate in the House floor in any other place. That's the phrasing of it. And as a matter of fact, I guess I could uh, bring up the actual text and read you the whole thing, because it also covers a couple of other things uh, about privilege from arrest uh, in uh, as a member of Congress. So let's see, where are we? The legislative branch, we got to get down to like section six, I think. Uh, the, do, 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 there we are, here we go. Um, oh no, is it six or is it five? Hmm. All right, well, i got to find it again. But at any rate, it doesn't matter very much which section it's in, but it does matter if I want to read it to you. Uh, there we are. Yes, Section 6, Clause 1. So the entirety of the clause, you know, and I don't mean to bore you if you've already read the Constitution this morning. The senators and representatives shall receive a compensation for their services. That has nothing to do with it. It's great, but, you know, okay. Uh, to be ascertained by law and paid under the Treasury of the United States. They shall... This is the important part. They shall in all cases, and here's some stuff to consider too. They shall in all cases accept treason. Uh-oh. Oh, oh and uh, we, we forgot to play our horror dramatic music. So why not do it now for treason? As well as Friday the 13th. The important part of the clause. They shall in all cases accept treason, felony, and that's broad, and breach of the peace. That could be what happened on January 6th if you don't want to go with treason, they shall be privileged from arrest during their attendance at the session of their respective houses. That would be now, of course. And in going to and returning from the same. That's part one of the clause. This doesn't have to do with the speech and debates per se, but uh, the second part of the clause does. But, uh, okay, so you're privileged from arrest during coming and going from the session and while you are in session that's the that could pose a, an issue right especially if you are what trying to use statutory contempt to bring uh bring them to heel with respect to their defiance of the subpoenas well, who will arrest them who would place them under arrest and punish them for their contempt if they are privileged from arrest right during their attendance at the session and in coming and going. You just basically, I mean, I guess you, you could arrest them after they've been, after the Congress has adjourned. Uh, they might say, well, I'm not, I won't leave, or you can't arrest me while I'm leaving, and uh, I'm going through the process of coming and or going to Congress at all times, even during the, the uh, adjournments. You know, you, you could try and make that excuse, and it might even work. 
But anyway, the speech and debate part of it comes after this. So you're privileged from arrest during attendance at the session end and coming and going to the same. Uh, but also privileged from arrest and for any speech or debate in either house, they shall not be questioned in any other place. That's the full clause. So usually people say, well, you can't, you know, bring me up on charges for what I say in the house. And they're, but they're usually thinking in court, using the police, etc. But again, that last part, in any other place. The January 6th committee does not intend to question these members of Congress in any other place. The intention is to question them right there in the committee, a committee of the House of Representatives, a part of Congress. Uh, the idea, of course is that, um, well, in, in addition to protecting their ability to express any idea uh, on the House floor or Senate floor, as the case may be, during debate and not be hassled by it by the, you know, the rest of the government, that's the issue. The executive branch can't arrest them for it and the uh, judicial branch can't sentence them for it. But all of this is taking place inside the legislative branch. There's no interbranch conflicts coming into play here. And don't forget that another part of Article 1 gives each house the right to, one, set its own rules of proceedings, and two, discipline its own members as they see fit, right? So, and, you know, as well as giving them the ability to expel them on a two-thirds vote, but we don't even need to get to that, and we probably won't, because there's no way they'll get around to voting to expel them, probably. As long as there's enough Republicans, uh, as long as the House is one-third Republican, they're not going to expel any Republicans. But that's the interesting part right there, that they're uh, saying, well, speech and debate clause. I saw lots of people with enough confidence in, in the uh, applicability of the clause to answer these things. You know, well, so here's the subpoenas and they're being served and here's the news and I someone else tweets it out and they say and they're going to say speech and debate clause biatches and then everybody's going to say read the whole thing biatches it says question you can't be questioned for what you say in speech or debate in any other place and there's only one place that isn't any other place and that's this place and that's who's issuing the subpoenas luckily for us we subpoenaed you and you are directed to report to exactly that one place where you can, in fact, be questioned for your speech and or debate on the House floor. So I don't think that's actually available to them. Now, on the other hand, people did point out, and I did anticipate this as well, people point out very quickly, um, they're very adept at ignoring certain parts of the Constitution that they don't like. They forget about the whole well-regulated militia thing all the time. They love reading the Second Amendment in part and pretending that's the whole thing. And to date, they've managed to actually convince the Supreme Court, if, if you believe in settled law and the value of precedent and stare decisis, which we don't anymore because we were told that's pretty wrong to do that. But Apparently, there is a now worthless precedent that says that uh, the well-regulated militia part is a nullity and you can forget about it. So I suppose you could forget about the in any other place thing as well. But it is pretty explicit. Anyway, we probably won't get to that because underlying it all is the political will to do these things. When you're talk And you're talking about the, this, well... I guess another part of the discussion is the trade-off that is supposedly happening, the calculation that's being made supposedly in the minds of both Republicans and Democrats at this point. Republicans have, of course, threatened already. It's been months already since they threatened to uh, retaliate against Democrats should they be able to win a majority in the House in the next Congress, that if you subpoena Republican members, we will subpoena Democratic members later. And of course, we will uh, subpoena them for the super serious investigations <clears throat> of, well, oh, I don't know, let's say uh, Solyndra, Benghazi, Teapot Dome, for that matter, even though that was a Republican scandal. But what the hell? Let's just say it was Democrats and 
prosecute them for it. And of course, you know, all the new things that they've made up as well. Uh, Hunter Biden's laptop. Uh, apparently the, the, the new catchphrase, thanks to somebody made a movie about it and might have even called the movie this. Uh, the, but now Republicans running around, as they have often done, running around screaming their accusations in code that no normal people understand because they haven't seen the conspiracy movie about it. Uh, we'll prosecute you for Hunter Biden's laptop. Oh, I know about that one. We'll prosecute you for 2,000 mules. What? We're, we're not on that page. I found out what that's about, by the way. So somebody made a, a movie that either references that phrase or might even be called, that might even be titled it, 2,000 Mules. The idea is supposed to be that there are some 2,000 or so people who they accuse of being mules, not in the strict sense that they are actually have you know transformed into that animal, but rather that they were so-called mules borrowed from the uh, drug trade, carrying cargo here. But here we're talking about people who Republicans are accusing of uh, harvesting ballots during the 2020 elections and carrying them to the ballot collection boxes that were used very frequently thanks to the pandemic and that that is somehow illegal, which I think it actually isn't. But uh, in some places it might be there. They have some very weird ballot handling rules in certain states and uh you never know. And, and, but at any rate, they have their accusation that they're leveling is that they've identified something in a neighborhood of 2000 people, I guess, who have done this thing, which you know, may or may not in some states, as I said, actually be illegal. But, on, you know, on common sense inspection, actually, it's not such a bad thing. I see the. I think we all understand the potential for problems, but if you then examine the ballots and they seem to be legitimate, it, sure, it really shouldn't matter who carries it to the ballot box, but in some states it does. Anyway, that's their thing, and they now think that everybody understands that if they just say 2,000 mules, everyone will go, God damn, I'm guilty as charged. We we give up. But anyway, uh, so as I was saying, <laughs> they think that they have everybody dead to rights and they can't wait apparently, to subpoena Democrats in the next Republican-dominated Congress to retaliate, which is, of course, also not the way that you're supposed to do this stuff. Oh, by the way, breaking news that just popped up on my screen thanks to Twitter. Uh, UAE President Sheikh Khalifa bin Zayed has died. And um, does that mean... That's not MBZ from UAE, but that's, I guess, KBZ. Is he different from MBZ? Uh, the counterpart to MBS, Mr. Bonesaw, over in Saudi Arabia. But I'll see if we can look that up and find out whether. Anyway, he, was, he hasn't sought anybody up as far as I know, so it's not quite as momentous uh, a bit of news. But at any rate, um, Back to our own domestic problems. So the idea was, well, Republicans will retaliate and subpoena Democrats and make their lives miserable in the next Republican Congress if you subpoena us now, which is, again, not the way things are supposed to work, but fine, whatever, that's what they're going to do. And yesterday, I don't know, there were there were certainly people out there who are very smugly, and I guess, I don't know, even today, Going, I, I feel like they're doing it smugly. They probably don't feel like they're being smug about it, but they're going and they're saying they've got uh, Democrats have got Republicans in a bind here. They're betting on this. Uh, Republicans say they're going to, quote unquote, retaliate, which really you should be saying right off the bat. That's actually childish and not the way that government is supposed to work. But OK, we're past that. But they have them over a barrel because how are Republicans going to sit there and say and fight these subpoenas now by saying it's invalid, it's unconstitutional, you can't subpoena me because reasons, whether they're you know valid reasons or uh, misunderstandings of actual valid reasons or whatever it is, you can't do it. And how are they going to then turn around in the next Congress, if that goes poorly at the ballot box here, or the next Republican Congress, and say, Aha, well, now we'll subpoena Democrats and Democrats have to obey these subpoenas. That's hypocrisy, for God's sake. Hypocrisy. Play some dramatic music. Yeah. How are they going to say, you can't enforce subpoenas against me, but I can enforce subpoenas against you? And, of course, 
you know, those of us who have been listening to the show for long enough or have a, you know, brain in our head or remember recent history or like last week or whatever, are we're able to say, what do you mean how? They'll just, they'll just do it. I know, but it's hypocritical. I know, but they'll still do it. They don't care. Remember that the playbook says, you know, you have to be prepared for this. They're going to call you a hypocrite and they might even be right. They're going to call you a hypocrite. Don't let it bother you. Go ahead, do what you're going to do, and then you'll be right and they'll be wrong, and who cares what they call you? How are they going to do it? How are they going to, how are they not going to do it? And, and if you need an illustration of how the scene will go, it will go something like this. How are you going to put me in jail for doing something that you did just last week? How are you going to do it? And the answer is like this, and then ching, the doors of the cells, you know, clank closed. And they walk away and then you say, well, how can you possibly do this? This is hypocrisy. And then they'll be like, what? I can't hear you over the noise of your cell door slamming shut. Yeah, you know, even if they do hear you. Yeah, it's hypocrisy, but you're in jail. So what do I care? And you'll say, but that's outrageous. You just proved that there's no way to subpoena a member of Congress. And they'll say, no, you proved that there's no way to subpoena a Republican. We just put you in jail as proof that there's a way to subpoena a Democrat. And, you know, then they'll be there with that little Charlie Brown, like scribble, scrabble cloud over their head and saying, I can't believe that I got myself into this situation. I, that's I, I, I don't know how else to explain it. What do you mean? How are you going to give me Tarianism? That's how they're going to. I just wish more people understood that. But uh, apparently they don't. And uh, anyway, inherent contempt is, of course, how they could put somebody in jail for this thing. Everybody forgets about it, but you shouldn't. There's no better case, no clearer case for inherent contempt than when members are subpoenaed by members before Congress. Hi, I'm Scott Anderson, the guy that writes the daily summary for this show, k Grove in the Morning. Thank you to everyone that supports this show. Many of you send donations through PayPal, Patreon, Square Cash, Radio Public, and so on. Some of you write your own essays and send them in, or read articles with your own commentary. We appreciate it. Now, some of you are listening to this and thinking, I'd like to help, but isn't there something I could do that wouldn't require money or effort? Why, yes, there is. You can just like us. On Daily Coast, they call it the recommend button. YouTube has a thumbs up. There are hearts and likes and love buttons. Tap our love button. Tap our love button every day. Share our shows and summaries on Facebook and Twitter, YouTube and iTunes, Stitcher and Amazon. Most of these places allow you to write a review, so a sentence or two would be great. Recommend us to social media or tell your friends to listen to the show. You aren't just helping us, you're helping them find their new favorite thing to listen to. You could change the world. So thank you in advance for me and everybody else in the world. Okay, welcome back to the K-Grown in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Let's continue on. Yeah, I know. I ate up the whole first segment on it. I'm not going to get to all the things I wanted to get to. Uh, I am uh, notified by Rebecca Romans, uh, who, by the way, in case it's been a while since I have called out her Twitter name, which is Lambs, L-A-M-B-S, Lambs and Beds. Do I have that? Unless it's, uh, I, I think, unless it's Lamb Send Beds. Like, uh, who's going to send you this bed? This lamb right here. But lambs and beds is how you'll find her on Twitter in case you've been uh, wondering, hey, how can I get these notices without having to wait for you to retweet them? Although, actually, she's quite adept at using the KITM hashtag. So that's the actual answer. So there's probably none of you that don't know how to follow Rebecca. But uh, if there were, that's now over. Thank you. Anyway, she was reminding me, or reminding me, right, informing me in the first instance, I believe, that 2,000 Mules, I guess that is the actual title of the piece, uh, was made by convicted election fraudster Dinesh D'Souza, in case you were wondering just how terrible this thing was going to be if you decided to go and take a look at it. Uh, the answer is don't bother. But okay. Uh, once again, Dinesh D'Souza thinks he's setting the agenda for a discussion among Republicans. And I guess he is, but the rest of the country is going to be, it's going to be years before people catch up on this, if they ever figure out what these things are. Anyway, so 
Uh, as I mentioned on the uh, way out from the break, no better case for inherent contempt than this. There's no interbranch interference. There's no reason in the world why uh, members of Congress shouldn't face inherent contempt punishment for defying subpoenas from their colleagues. The Congress, of course, has, well, plenary powers when it comes to punishing its own members. It's only the expulsion penalty in which they're limited to requiring a two-thirds majority to, to do that. And, and I suppose, as opposed to expelling you, they could just throw you in jail and keep you there and you can't vote if you can't get out of jail. And there would be, I guess, a con there's a constitutional case to be made that you're depriving the people of this district of their chosen representative. But the answer to that is tough noogies. The Constitution says we get to punish our own members for disorderly behavior. And this is disorderly behavior. Doesn't that mean that Republicans could subpoena all Democrats in and some future Congress in which they control uh, the majority and subpoena them on trumped up or even fake charges and throw them all in jail. Yes, it does mean that. What's the limitation on that then? The limitation on that is the consent of the governed. And, you know, you take matters into your own hands at that point. Everything's out the window if they're just doing that. So you don't have to worry too much about the constitutional order at that point. But you could point to it and say, well, you know, it was probably never the intention of the founders that one political party, which wasn't even the intention of the founders that they would exist, can just imprison the entirety of the opposition during their service in Congress. You know, one or two or 10 or even 15 members with good cause, yes. But, uh, you know, then, of course, you're going to have a debate about what are what constitutes good cause. Uh, we made up these subpoenas for made up charges, but we are the majority. We can say they're real. Yes, they can. And the, 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 you know, like I said, the, the limitation on it is the limitation of the, I guess, supporters of the other party, not sacking the Capitol again. So have you come around to legitimizing insurrection? Uh, it was never just outright illegitimate by itself, I mean, you know, a show of force is a show of force. You, you can All you can do is point to the Constitution and tap the sign and see whether it does you any good. If it brings out the police force in opposition to the insurrection and the insurrectionists lose, then great. If it brings out the police force but the insurrectionists win, then the Constitution either gets rewritten or is invalid and who cares, you got bigger problems. That's the political science answer to the whole thing. Anyway, um, as I said, no better uh, situation in which to use inherent contempt. You don't have to lean on any of the other branches. You don't have to worry about anybody making a... Oh, they'll make the claim anyway, but you don't have to worry about there being much validity to the claim that uh, 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 conflict, you know, a uh, separation of powers issues prevents you from punishing a member for non-compliance with the subpoena. Uh, still the question of exactly where do you put them and who does all of this stuff, but you know how you remember how this stuff works. The uh, uh, sergeant at arms in the house acts in the role of sheriff, commands uh, the Capitol police forces to, I guess, arrest or at least detain these members. Uh, there's always, of course, the, the still... Uh, still extant uh, misunderstanding about there being a jail cell in the Capitol uh, complex itself. And I, I think they might actually have some temporary holding cells for people who are arrested at the Capitol, but then they're transferred pretty quickly to the D.C. jail. But um, in years past, when we've analyzed the uh, nuts and bolts of how an inherent contempt charge might work, if you needed to hold somebody, the answer was, yeah, they'd put you in the D.C. jail. Um, so, I mean doesn't matter that there's no facilities in the house. So I suppose they could set facilities up in the house or elsewhere. doesn't really matter. But you know how it works. And, uh, you know, you just have the rough equivalent of the sheriff and a police force and a jail cell uh, inside the legislative branch. Now, of course, that will shock and surprise everybody. 
uh, because inherent contempt hasn't been used for almost 100 years. I guess it's 90-something years at this point. It was last used in the 1930s. We're about 10 years shy of the centennial of the last use of, uh, I guess, 12 years shy of the last use of uh, inherent contempt. And it'll shock everybody. But, you know, there's a case to be made that it would be even more shocking in the instances in which we've discussed using it in the past. That would be when members of the executive branch defy subpoenas from Congress when they're investigating the administration and they refuse to go. But there you at least have interbranch conflicts that could lead somebody in the in a black robe to conclude that hmm, maybe this isn't the right way to handle things. But all inside one branch, it should be pretty cut and dried. But the shock value of throwing, tossing somebody in a prison cell, well, you know, that might upset people. It might not. And I guess it depends if it's five or six and they're loudmouth and they're a-holes and everybody hates them except for the people who elect them in their district. But there's a clear case to be made and it's generally accepted, even if it's not widely accepted among radical Republicans, that a crime has been committed here. You've got something to lean on. Couldn't the Republicans do the same? Sure, they could. Will they? Well, yeah. I mean, except they'll actually probably do the imprisoning part. Where Democrats are saying, oh, we have them over a barrel because hypocrisy. How will they subpoena us when they defied subpoenas? The answer is they just will. The difference will be that in the meantime, when Democrats subpoena Republicans and Republicans defy the subpoenas, The Democrats will say, that's enough for us, because now it's on record that you, quote unquote, can defy congressional subpoenas and nothing will happen. But all that will be on the record at that point is that you can defy subpoenas issued by Democrats and nothing will happen. It doesn't speak at all to what happens when you defy subpoenas issued by Republicans. The gimmitarian view on this is, you obey, you know, what kind of subpoenas are valid? Subpoenas against you are invalid. Subpoenas for others that you've issued are valid. That's the way it, you know, I'm not a hypocrite. I'm totally consistent. Subpoenas for me are invalid. Subpoenas uh, uh, by me are valid. That's it. Just straight up. How will they do it? They just will. I don't know. I can't explain it any better than that. But yeah, in all likelihood, Democrats won't actually, you know, they're uh, satisfied with establishing the hypocrisy of it. They're not going to say, they're really not going to contemplate that if in this instance, even here where it's members of Congress under subpoena, this is like the ultimate test of congressional subpoena authority. We've already seen that diluted under the statutory contempt authority. There's just very little can happen or that the uh, the attorney general and the U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia can pretty much invalidate the whole thing. But they've always at least pointed and said, well, the real power lies in the fact that there's inherent contempt. Don't make us use it, but this is where the power comes from. And if they also won't use it here in the in the actual situation which it's perhaps most uh clearly designed for then you really say yeah now we got a real problem with subpoena power it might not exist but then republicans will dissuade you of that by actually exercising it it doesn't necessarily mean that's another part of the problem right democrats will say that well then in that case there's no such thing as subpoena power no again it's just that there's no such thing as democratic subpoena power Republicans, just the same way, will say, no, no, actually, this is inherent power and we will enforce it. If they arrest you and throw you in jail for it, are you going to sit there and say, that's not fair. There's no subpoena power. No, no, you didn't want subpoena power. We do. That's what happened here. But that's crazy. That's not consistent or logical. It's hypocritical. Yeah, well, you're the one in jail, not me. And I don't know. I don't think I need the whole second segment to explain that now. I I think I've hammered that home by now. But what's weird is there's like elected officials running around saying, what? I've never heard that. And that's because they don't listen to the show. Tell them to listen to the show or tell them what you learned here. By the way, uh, on that news update, yes, uh, the, the person who has 
died is the UAE president, Sheikh Khalifa bin Zayed. Mohammed bin Zayed, MBZ, the one we know, is what? Uh, Half-brother of Khalifa. Uh, but Khalifa apparently has been in the job of, well, in the in the role of president, but has been kind of incapacitated more or less by a stroke since 2014. And his half-brother, Mohammed, has been the de facto ruler of the UAE in his stead since then. So I guess what has happened here is uh, Khalifa has finally died. I mean, I guess there was just a matter of time waiting for him uh, to die from the stroke that debilitated him some nine, eight years ago. And uh, that has happened. And I guess now nothing stands in the way of MBZ claiming the uh, de jure rule as well of uh, of the UAE. And uh, I guess continuing his alliance with MBS, Mr. Bonesaw in neighboring Saudi Arabia. So just to clear that up, uh, it's not MBZ, but his half brother. And this is not a curtailment of his power or the end of it because he died, but probably rather an enhancement of it. Okay. Uh, in, oh, another, con for consistency's sake, I have to tell you, the uh, New York Times coronavirus tracker puts uh, Loudoun County, some of you are waiting for the update, at 175 cases on average over the last seven days, a 6% increase from the day before, so things creeping up. I remember when we were just breaking three digits, this won't be four digits, but it will put a two as the first digit of our three fairly shortly. Okay, so now that out of the way. Something else I wanted to tell you about. What the hell was it? I can hardly even remember. But uh, many of them parked in my Twitter feed. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to switch directions and bring you a long read that's been languishing in pocket for some time that goes back to another of our long-standing theories that uh, you need to know about and that will probably scare the crap out of you in one way or another. Okay, it's about uh, it's about Russia. And it's about Russia being a mob operation, something we have asserted here for a long time. And we've compared them to, you know, organized crime uh, for some time. And now let's uh, roll out an interesting report that helps establish that. Goes back in time just a little bit. But if you've ever wondered about um, the whys of all of this, uh, how is it, or rather, uh, I guess the mechanics of it, maybe, how is it that they convinced actual organized crime figures from outside the government that this is an arrangement that would work, that organized crime would like it, that they'd get something out of it? Um, you know, uh, and it might have been far-fetched at the time to say, you know, what would, what Organized crime family wouldn't want to have control of nuclear weapons or a seat on the U.N. Security Council, permanent seat on the U.N. Security Council. Uh, you could be enormously influential that way, don't you think? That would be a good euphemism for what you could you could do with those. Um, but they might say that's eh, beyond the purview of organized crime, typically, traditionally. Uh, how do I know you can deliver on these things? Well, OK, small bore uh, goals first, then. I mean, you do have an interest in making and keeping a whole lot of money, right? Yes. All right. Well, perhaps we could demonstrate for you the benefits of this partnership and the um, the viability of this partnership on a smaller scale first. And I guess that's what they did. And we learned this from the OCCRP. Do you remember uh, who it is that we're talking about here? Uh, I can't remember the name, uh, the full name beyond the acronym, but uh, I recognize it as the uh, Russian-based opposition uh, uh, publication, and I think it might be uh, the publication of Alexander Navalny, or at least originally. Let me look him up. It's the OCCRP, the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, Um it does say that, well, it doesn't, doesn't credit uh, Navalny for it, but maybe he's been feeding them information. Uh, but they seem to work in parallel. 
uh, Navalny's major charge against Russian government authority being their corruption. But in fact, it was founded by, uh, it says here, Drew Sullivan and Paul Radu, R-A-D-U. The organized, I'm going to read you the Wikipedia uh, entry as a setup. The Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project is a consortium of investigative centers, media and journalists operating in Eastern Europe, the Caucasus, Central Asia, and Central America as well. It was founded in 2006 and specializes in organized crime and corruption. It publishes its stories through local media and in English and Russian through its website. In 2017, NGO Advisor ranked it 69th, nice, in the world in their annual list of the 500 best non-governmental organizations. Uh, that being what NGO means, by the way. Um, one of these days I should look up whether there is any formal uh, uh, alignment with Navalny or not. But he certainly does similar work. So, at any rate, I have to... Have to back away from that connection unless I'm able to establish it uh, later on. Or you, if you establish it later on, let me know. And uh, tweet me the links and we'll back it all up. All right. Anyway, here's what's going on. Let me just dive into the story because it's really quite fascinating. And I haven't read it all the way through yet. But uh, it's looking pretty good and pretty interesting. Fueling secession. We have that problem occasionally here in the United States, but it also happens around the world. Fueling secession. Promising bitcoins. By the way, that was a be much better promise at the beginning of this week than it is now. But uh, it doesn't matter. You understand what's going on here. Fueling secession. Promising bitcoins. How a Russian operator. Operator. Come on urged Catalonian leaders to break with Madrid. What? Spain? I didn't think we were going there. Yes, Catalonian leaders referred to the man who offered them troops and money, troops, for God's sake, to secede from Spain as Putin's envoy. That's how they referred to him there in Catalan. Reporters identified him as Nikolai Sadovnikov. I'm hoping that's even close to the pronunciation. S-A-D-O, like Sado, like Sadomasism. Sadov, Sadov, though, is actually what... Sadovnikov, Sadovnikov, Sadovnikov. I don't know how you would do it. It doesn't matter, except that I'll just embarrass myself for the next hour uh, trying to decide. He is a longtime diplomat, so he has that kind of immunity, who reportedly worked as a strategic advisor to the Russian foreign minister. By the way, another great benefit for mobsters, if that's what you really are, uh, and you want to run around the world indulging in organized crime, what better reason to enter into partnership with the government than to be issued diplomatic passports so that you can go and do your crimes in other countries, and then when you get caught, flash the diplomatic passport and say, Time for me to go. And everyone will say, that's ridiculous. That's just a, you, all you did was give a diplomatic passport to a criminal. That can't be right. And you, the answer for that is, I don't know what to tell you. The government did it. For better or for worse. They may, maybe it was a big mistake, but they did it. And they're a government and they have a flag and all the people in it wear suits. And we have a permanent seat on the UN Security Council. So we must be a government. And, I, you know, what does Spain say to that? I guess ooh, I guess you got to let them go. Um, in case we don't get all the way through it, do you want to know what the key findings are and bullet points? Or do you want to start reading uh, the story for the narrative value of it? Let's just jump into the story. In the run-up to Catalonia's historic 2017 parliamentary vote to declare independence from Spain, do you remember that? The leader of the restive region received a shocking offer. How shocking was it? Dramatically, dramatically shocking. A mysterious, quote, Russian group, like we don't even know what to call this bunch of people, organized crime, criminals, mafia. A mysterious Russian group reportedly offered President Carles, oh boy, uh, Catalonian names, Car Carles, like Carlos, but with an E, Carles, uh, Puigdemont. Puigdemont, P-U-I-G-D-E-M-O-N-T, you know, perfect for Catalonia. Uh, blend of Spanish and French is the way it looks to me. Carles Puigdemont 
They offered him money and 10,000 armed soldiers to make the break with Madrid. I don't know whether they said they were going to send actual Russian troops or whether they meant mercenaries or whatever. Now, of course, they can't afford the 10,000 troops. And, of course, the Bitcoin part sucks. But we haven't even gotten to that point. So a mysterious Russian group reportedly offers president of Catalonia money and soldiers to make the break with Madrid, to like make it serious. Yes, there was a, a, you know, a referendum being held and everybody likes to say, oh, we honor the outcome of a vote. But ultimately, you know, would it be the case? It was an open question. What if they vote yes on independence? Would Spain say, OK, you voted? Maybe in the modern era, yes, you say that. In years past, no, doesn't matter. But adding money and troops to the situation makes it kind of real, doesn't it? If they follow through with it. This information emerged when? In 2020, three years later, in the Spanish media. But since then, little more has been known about what exactly happened. Now, for the first time, a joint investigation by OCCRP, El Periodico, Bellingcat, IRPI, which I don't know offhand, and Il Fato Cotidiano, and iStories, there's a lot of people involved in this, reveals key new details about that offer, how it was made, and by whom. As it turns out, Puigdemont met with men who represented, or rather presented themselves, as envoys of the Russian government in the Casa del Canones, his official residence, the president's residence there, the president's residence in Catalan, uh, Catalonia, on the eve of Catalonia's independence vote. So they showed up and they said, we are envoys of the Russian government. And again, how can you even tell? You can't tell who's in the Russian government and who's not. It's very difficult to know. And if they say they are, and I mean, you could choose to believe them, you could choose not to believe them. If they'll kill you, if you say, I don't believe you, then what's the difference? But I don't know if that threat was necessarily made. But anybody could be. And besides, he's carrying a diplomatic passport. I have to kind of believe this, right? Chief among his interlocutors was Nikolai Sadovnikov, whom Catalonian independence leaders privately described as Putin's envoy. And that's in quotes. The former Soviet and Russian diplomat, post-Soviet Russian diplomat, had a history of representing the Kremlin in sensitive conflict areas and had been noticed by at least one Western intelligence agency, which flagged him as having a direct line to the Russian head of state. So, you know, all indications are that, yeah, he's speaking to us with Putin's backing here. What does he say? The involvement of a figure with Sadovnikov's resume suggests that Moscow's efforts to foment division in Spain may have been more serious than previously known. Kremlin watchers have long warned that President Vladimir Putin had come to believe that undermining European unity was in Russia's interest. I think it's easy to see why they would believe that and, and uh, make some sense, right? Kair Giles, I don't know how he's pronouncing that, Kair Gilles, I don't know. Kair, K-E-I-R, Giles, G-I-L-E-S, a Russia expert at the British think tank Chatham House, maybe that's Giles, if he's pronouncing it British style, Care Giles, I don't know, uh, at Chatham House, said Russia has a zero-sum view of security, believing that there's only so much to go around. Hmm. Therefore, if Russia weakens another country by eroding the population's faith in institutions, by devolving its regions, by challenging its constitution its democratic processes, its legal systems, then by comparison, Russian by default, Russia really, by default becomes stronger, he said. And you can see how that might be true and you can see how it's sort of happening here in the United States. Is any of that familiar to you? Challenging the Constitution, devolving its regions, eroding faith in its uh, institutions, democratic processes, legal systems, etc.? That Russia would do so by reaching out to separatist leaders in Spain is consistent with past behavior, said Luis Shelley, director of the Terrorism, Transnational Crime, huh, and Corruption Center at George Mason University in Virginia. Not the School of Law, but the university itself. The linkages between the Catalonians and the Russians go back to the Soviet era. 
Before the collapse of the USSR, high-level meetings were held in Barcelona with distinguished Russians, said Shelley. So they've been trying this for a long time because it makes sense, right? Undermining a Western ally like Spain makes sense. Things were more subtle then than sowing dissent, but relationships are built by Russians for the long term. But the affair also had some unexpected elements. Text messages obtained by reporters, as well as an interview with a person present at the meeting, reveal that the Russians demanded that Catalonia pass favorable cryptocurrency legislation in exchange for their support. That's what they that's a nut that's the sweetener to bring in the mobsters. What do we care if we undermine the Western Alliance? Well, here's one thing we could do for you. In turn, the Russians promised to give Catalonia $500 billion. It's not just some money. $500 billion to aid their attempts to gain independence, a figure that strains credulity. How in the world could you even afford to do that? Well, part of it is what they get in exchange, right? Though Catalonia never became independent, the man representing the Russians stayed in touch and continued to promise funds in support of the separatists' efforts. Most of his promises appeared to amount to nothing, though on one occasion the Catalonians received a single Bitcoin worth just under $10,000 at the time. But that's no $500 billion, but it's something. Just, I'm sure, a show of good faith, but that they were going to do it in Bitcoin is really interesting by itself. Now, on being familiarized with reporters' findings, Christopher Nering, a lecturer in intelligence history at the University of Potsdam, said some of the Russian overtures to Catalonia seemed odd. On the one hand, he said, some of the people the Catalonians were speaking to obviously had an affiliation with Russian intelligence services. On the other hand, the alleged demand to turn Catalonia into, quote, the Switzerland of cryptocurrency sounds like a business scam. And it's funny, too, because that he uses that to actually delegitimize the whole thing. Well, it sounds like a business scam, not like something the Russian government would do. Well, what if the Russian government were actually made up of business scammers, is another word for mobsters? Uh, makes a little bit more sense, don't you think? More after this. All right, welcome back now to the KGO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Shoo, okay, let's continue on with this. But this is starting to shape up in a way that makes some sense to you here. Uh, so who are we talking to? The uh, Christopher Nering, the lecturer on intelligence history at the University of Potsdam, saying, well, okay, they definitely had some affiliation with Russian intelligence services, but this idea of turning Catalonia into the Switzerland of cryptocurrency sounds like a business scam. Now, combining both parts, it sounds like we're looking at covert intelligence-backed support for a separatist movement with a scam or fraud component on the side. Giles agreed that the Russian overtures to Catalonia looked like a mixed operation between political interference and the drive for profit, which is sort of what you might expect, I would add, if there were, in fact, Blurred lines between organized crime and the so-called Russian government. Well, this part of the deal is something the Russian government, as we've always known it, might be involved in. This is something we would traditionally expect from organized crime. What could possibly explain how this chocolate got into this peanut butter? Or, if you prefer, how this peanut butter got onto this chocolate? Well, you know, we can debate it back and forth, but we don't dispute that this is peanut butter and this is chocolate, right? And they seem to be working in harmony here. We're being presented with the Reese's peanut butter cup of propositions here. If you manage to become independent, you will be sovereign. You can set your own policies. One of the policies we think you should set is make yourself the Wild West, or if you prefer, the Switzerland of cryptocurrency. Turn Catalonia into a cryptocurrency haven. And by the way, let us in and let us operate here because, I mean, cryptocurrency I mean, it should, be, should go without saying that obviously it's outside of uh, governmental control. Anybody then can trade in it. You just need some place to protect where the transactions are made and cataloged. And if a sovereign government will do that and offer protection, like, I guess, literally 
to the uh, server, the data centers that run the whole operation, then I guess you have what you want. Why they couldn't do that in Russia, I don't know, except maybe they figured people won't invest. I mean, it's a dangerous investment to pour a lot of money into Russia. Uh, now, the funny thing is people wouldn't pour that kind of capital, I don't think, at this point, into Russia. Maybe Republicans would. But you wouldn't pour this kind of capital into Russia precisely because you know the danger that's presented by the blurring of the lines between the government and organized crime. They could steal that money and then say it wasn't criminals that stole it, or even if it was, the point is that the sovereign government of this country says you can't come in and extradite people, you can't arrest people, you can't prosecute, we won't prosecute them, nothing's going to happen, they can just steal your money and live here, live the lives they were living here before without fear of prosecution. And our nuclear weapons stand in the way of your taking any kind of revenge. Well, with that in mind, people aren't going to, you know, continue to pour their resources into Russia. They've they've done all sorts of things like this. They've nationalized things before under Bolsheviks, and now they're just telling you, well, we'll just steal it outright under this organized crime government. But... If you could run the same operation and have the same people running it, Russian criminals, but have it happening in Catalonia, people would say, oh, Catalonia, that's not Russia. Let's go there. Nominally, there are some Catalonian people in charge of things. But if you search beneath the surface, you find out it's actually Russian mobsters running it. You'll get robbed just as surely in Catalonia as you will in Russia. But you know, the hope is that some number of people will invest their money in Catalonia. Barcelona, I've been there. That place is great. Yeah. Woo. We'll go there and go on a pub crawl. It's going to be fantastic. And we'll make billions of dollars. And then, then the money is stolen. And then you post on Twitter, oh, all my apes are gone. And nobody feels bad for you. Uh, and even if they did, it wouldn't matter because the Russian government says, well, one, it's not us. It's Catalonia. Invade them if you don't like it. And two, uh, if you figure out it's us, we'll friggin' kill you. Oh, I can't figure out who did this to me, all of a sudden. So, yeah, that's what it looks like. The close and intimate connections between political power and organized crime is a defining feature of so much of modern Russia's means of projecting power, I say. But that's only saying that because he said it. Who said it? Giles. That's his final quote on the matter, at least before the uh, jump out. Uh, here on the next page. Uh, yeah, so it's a mixed operation between political interference and a drive for profit. The close and intimate connection between political power and organized crime, the blurred lines, is a defining feature of so much of modern Russia's means of projecting power. Reached by telephone, Sadovnikov, they actually got the guy on the phone, strongly denied, not just denied, but strongly denied, having any connection to the Russian government or any intelligence agencies, unless you arrest him, in which case he'll produce the diplomatic passport and say, I do have those connections. But on the phone, he'll deny them. He also denies, of course, offering anything to the Catalonians. He acknowledged that he had traveled to Barcelona in late October 2017, just happened to be about the time they were going to have the referendum, and had been taken to a meeting, quote, by a friend, but he didn't really know who was present because he doesn't speak Spanish. By the way, neither do Catalonians. They speak Catalan. But I don't think he speaks Catalan either, but it didn't matter. They were all willing to speak the language of business. I just sat and waited for him to finish. By the way, great trip to Barcelona. Hey, you want to take a vacation to Barcelona? Yes, let's go. Where do you want to go first? What sites do you want to see? I want to go with my friend to a meeting that I won't understand. All right. That seems rational. Whatever. You know, do whatever you like. Asked whether he could identify Puigdemont from a photo, Sadovnikov said he doubted it. He had suffered a serious bout of COVID-19, he said, and his life was no longer the same. That, I, I believe, could happen. In 2020, I practically died, and I've been born again, he said. I don't know whether that's, you know, religious or anything, or he's trying to wash himself clean of the sins, or basically he's just saying, I have brain fog and I can't recall anything, like Margie, three names over here. Puigdemont did not respond to requests for comment for this story. His close associate, Victor Teradalis, or Teradeas, perhaps, uh, who also attended the meeting, 
confirmed that the meeting took place and that a man named Nikolai, who reporters later identified as Sadovnikov, had participated. Not just been there. By the way, there's a little box here. How did reporters identify Sadovnikov if you're looking for their sources and methods? Um... I don't know if we need to read that necessarily. We'll just take their word for it that they correctly identified him and that they show their work here if you want to look. The fact that a Russian offer to Puigdemont had been made and rejected was disclosed in 2020 by a Spanish judge who was investigating the diversion of public funds for the independence movement. This, by the way, comes under the uh, section heading of parallel diplomacy, whatever that might mean. So, the fact that there had been this offer was discovered by a Spanish judge investigating the diversion of public funds for the independence movement. The judge cited messages retrieved by police from the phone of Puigdemont's close associate, Victor Terradeas, but provided no further information. When this news emerged, some Spanish publications treated it as a likely scam. The Russian embassy in Madrid even mocked it on Twitter suggesting sarcastically that the number of soldiers on offer was actually a hundred times larger. Like, yeah, we'll send you a million soldiers instead. Ha ha. But new information obtained by reporters from text messages, interviews with knowledgeable parties, intelligence reports, and court records provide a wealth of additional detail. Reporters were able to establish that the offer took place at a meeting with Nikolai Sadovnikov and an attendee confirmed that Sadovnikov himself had made it, not even in Spanish. Though much about Sadovnikov's background remains shrouded in mystery, there is plenty to suggest he is more than an unscrupulous freelancer. I wonder if I can get a pronunciation guide quickly on his last name. Well, you can look it up yourself and tell me how wrong I've been. The 64-year-old appears to have considerable experience in diplomacy, Diplomatic sources in Italy informed reporters that he served as a Soviet diplomat in Rome between 1984 and 1987 and as a deputy consul in Milan from 1991 until at least 1995, first for the Soviet Union, then for Russia. According to records from the Russian Foreign Ministry, a person named Nikolai Nikolai Nikolaevich Sadovnikov was identified as an employee until at least 2010. A conference agenda from 2007 identifies him as an advisor with the ministry's policy planning department. By 2012, he had appeared on the radar of at least one Western intelligence agency. Reporters were able to review an intelligence report from that year that describes him claiming to have direct ties to Vladimir Putin. The report describes Sadovnikov as an actor of Russian parallel diplomacy in Syria and Iran. Hmm, that deserves dramatic music probably as well. Though he acted under the... Oh, though he acted because he was... Acting. Right. He was, though he acted... <laughs> I've lost my place. Under the umbrella of the foreign ministry, he is accountable only to the head of state with whom he claims a certain proximity. So, a Putin buddy. According to the report, Sadovnikov is involved in the Syrian, Iranian, Libyan dossiers, and more generally in bilateral relations with the Gulf countries. Oh boy. His goal, it says, was to promote the convergence of interests between Russia and Iran, in order especially to reduce American influence in the region. It mentions a trip to Iran in April of 2012 and another following the following month to the United Arab Emirates. It was earlier in our news today, by coincidence, where Sadovnikov is said to have accompanied Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, you remember him, and taken part in meetings about oil exploitation. The report said it was a credible hypothesis that Sadovnikov was a Russian intelligence agent, but it could not establish that with any certainty. Since 2012, however, Sadovnikov has garnered less interest. According to uh, one of the intelligence sources, he was not considered, quote, a file who required close scrutiny. By the late 2010s, he had moved on to another region, at least according to uh, Pier Giorgio Bassi, 
an Italian lobbyist who acted as a guarantor for a visa Sadovnikov requested in January of 2016. When reporters reached Bossy, he said that in 2016 and 2017, Sadovnikov was working as an advisor for strategic foreign policy to Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, and that he specialized in the Catalonian issue. Next up, a strange meeting. Sadovnikov's meeting with the Catalonians took place in Puigdemont's official residence on the evening of October 26, 2017. The Catalonian parliament would vote for independence the next day, and Puigdemont was busy negotiating with both the Spanish government in Madrid and with his fellow Catalonians. But he also made time for the memorable Russian rendezvous. Sadovnikov was accompanied by two others, another Russian and a Spanish man who acted as an interpreter. I don't even speak Spanish, but neither do the Catalonians, but I brought an interpreter. That didn't get mentioned, did it? During the meeting, Teradeas confirmed Sadovnikov offered Puigdemont 10,000 Russian soldiers, just straight up Russian soldiers, although he may have had in his mind, well, I'll send you mercenaries, but would they have come in Russian, actual Russian uniform? That's the implication. 10,000 Russian soldiers if Catalonia became independent. Sadovnikov also promised the government of an independent Catalonia the eye-popping sum of $500 billion, according to text messages and photographs obtained by reporters. The amount seems improbable since the entire Russian state took in about $219 billion in revenues in 2017. So twice the entire tax revenues of the state. But, you know, one gets the sense that they have access to several billion dollars more than they took in through official taxation channels, uh, in addition to which they had a scheme to earn, quote-unquote, earn slash steal more of it later on. That is to say, cryptocurrency. In exchange, the Russian delegation had a single request, and it didn't have anything to do with Russian adoptions or anything, for an independent Catalonia to pass legislation favorable to cryptocurrency. They wanted it to be a financial center on par with Switzerland, but for digital money. The encounter ended with no firm commitments, and the Catalonians appeared puzzled by who they were dealing with. In messages to colleagues, Terra Deus referred to Sadovnikov as Nikolai the Mysterious, and even raised the possibility that he had... <gasps> underworld ties. What a strange conclusion to reach. What a weirdo. The guy is obviously crazy. I already think they are mafia, he wrote on the day after the meeting. Or where is the difference between mafia and political power? I'm beginning to think this Teradeus fellow is a genius. Nonetheless, Puigdemont told Teradeus to stay in touch with the Russians. I mean, they may be mobsters, but all Russians kind of are mobsters. So I guess stay in touch. The following day, the Catalonian parliament declared independence. It quickly became apparent their effort was a failure. Catalonia was not recognized as independent by Russia or any other major country. Some separatist leaders were arrested and sentenced to prison for sedition and misuse of public funds, while others, including Puigdemont, fled the country. Still, their relationship with the Russians endured. Hmm. Let's see. Next section. I'll go on my knees, it says as a quote here. What's this about? A key figure at the center of the communications was Jordi Sarda Bonhevi. Uh, I'm sorry, Bonvehi. Wow. Jordi Sarda Bonvehi, a Spaniard who sources said acted as Sadovnikov's interpreter during the Russians meeting with Puigdemont. Wouldn't that be interesting if the interpreter made the whole thing up? That'd be crazy. He's going to he's going to skim it. Well, they said they'd give you five hundred billion dollars. What? You know, even the Russians would be surprised at that. Who knows? Sarda is an enigmatic figure with his own checkered background. Maybe he did do this in 2012. He presented himself in. Oh, my God. You'll never guess. All right. What country should he present himself to now? Just make everybody gasp with horror. And of course, the well, oh, I said horror. So we need the horror. dramatic music. Okay, so one country. I'll give you, I don't know, I'll give you three guesses. Does anyone want to guess? No, never mind. It's radio. Uh, he presented himself in Ukraine, 2012, by the way. So we're still talking about uh, uh, 
uh, what's his name? Yanukovych and his government there, right? In 2012, he presented himself in Ukraine as a representative of a Spanish gas company and signed a deal with Vladislav Kaskiv, then head of Ukraine's state investment agency, to build a liquefied natural gas terminal on the Black Sea coast. But the company, Gas Natural, probably Natural, denied any involvement and said that Sarda had never been their representative. This agreed-upon terminal was never built, but in an investigation into the affair, Reuters referred to Sarda as a ski instructor turned businessman. Wow. That is some description. Uh, imagine that, right? You're a ski instructor, and then you just say, you know what, I'm going to go to Ukraine, and I'm going to sign a deal claiming that a Spanish natural gas company wants to build a liquefied natural gas terminal on the Black Sea coast. And okay, you know, I don't know whether you got the deal or not. Nothing materializes, but well, this guy's a ski instructor. Well, Lev Parnas is a, I don't know what. And he and Igor Fruman showed up and said, we're going to build a natural gas terminal, but not in the Black Sea, but uh, I think in the, did he say in the Baltics? And uh, pipe it in from there. All right, well, whatever. Mm, it's all about liquefied natural gas. Now, years later, Sarda appeared to have switched his focus to Russia. After accompanying Sedovnikov to his meeting with Puigdemont, he stayed in touch with Puigdemont's associate, Victor Terodeus, continuing to exchange text messages with him for many months. Sarda declined to comment for this story. So maybe Terodeus isn't that brilliant after all if he falls for the ski instructor guy who says... I don't know. My new job is involving myself in whatever the hot scam property is at the moment. In 2012, that's liquid natural gas in Ukraine. In 2017, that's cryptocurrency. Today, that's I don't know what. Uh, but uh, I guess weapons in Ukraine or slurp juice for your cosmic apes or astro. I don't know. Whatever. Anyway, whatever the current best scam there is of the day is I'm involved in that. And whatever country it's in, I'll go there. Nearly 200 pages of these messages extracted from the Terra Deus phone by Spanish police as part of a broader investigation into the diversion of public money were obtained by reporters. In his lengthy exchanges with Terra Deus, Sarda mentions Sadovnikov on multiple occasions, insinuating that he is an important decision maker in Putin's circles. That is Sadovnikov. He also portrays himself as an influential player with high-level connections, though little of what he promises ever appears to come to fruition. In one exchange, Teradeus urgently asks Sarda to undertake an unknown action. And the text is embedded here. Come on, Jordy, pound the table and do it today, please. If you want, I'll get on my knees, Teradeus is saying urgently asking Sarda to undertake an unknown action. In response, Sarda seems to insinuate that big plans are afoot. Good morning. I'll tell you something later. We will hit the table and break it in two pieces. I don't know what the hell that's even supposed to mean, but whatever. They're just vague uh, question and answer between one another. But it reminds you of all the other people of questionable business pedigree or governmental pedigree just... Uh, doing the same thing at the same time. There's a whole world of, of just crazy grifters out there. The Trump circles, these guys, Parnas and Fruman, they're all over the place. It's just scratching the surface here, I guess. But uh, what a surface. When Teradeus expresses doubt, Sarda tells him not to worry. Yes, but with the right people inside Catalonia, we'll be trapped. We need to be in place and with our people, because if not, with these cowards, we won't be able to do what's needed to be done, and Spain will drag us around, says Teradeus. This is an interesting answer from Sarda. Spain will not exist, and Europe barely. Wow, what does that mean? At one point, invoking a photoshopped image of Putin riding a bear that Teradeus had sent him, Sarda promises that the Russian leader would meet with the now-fugitive Puigdemont, whom he refers to using a nickname, The Child. I have important information for The Child, Sarda says. Now you have me intrigued, says Teradeus. A meeting with one of the top 
with the one on top of the bear, parentheses, official, before the elections. Teradea says, wow, holy merde, to use the French term, uh, Mierda for the Fr- for the Spanish. And now we have, do I have to bleep if it's in Spanish? Let's say no. But he says the S word because they're speaking in English somehow, I guess. Uh, I don't know. I wonder if this is translated or not. doesn't say. Anyway, uh, wow, holy crap, fantastic. Let's have dinner tonight and talk about it. And then uh, TMI, he says, a, I've even got a, well, he refers to his... Uh, his genitalia and the status of it at the time, uh, his excited state. These people are crazy and disgusting, by the way. But, uh, like, why would you introduce that into a discussion like this? Unless you thought you definitely were talking to mobsters, like, really, at a high-level diplomatic exchange like this? Uh, 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 okay. No such meeting is known to have taken place, but a few weeks later, Teradeus, who I now think considerably less of, tells Sarda that his support is critical. Yesterday, I said to my wife, Yudit, uh, if I had known you 10 or 20 years ago, we would be a republic. Catalonia, I guess. Back then, says Sarda, I didn't have the position I have today. Everything happens when it has to happen. Later on, Teradeus expresses envy of Sarda's association with the powerful Russians. It's very clear that you work for a powerful state. I love when you talk like that. It's the difference between being big and a state or being small and being a nation without a state. I've always wanted to be able to talk like you. I always thought that if I ever commanded something, if there was a state, I would talk like that. It's very sad, actually, and probably should seek counseling. But I guess that's how you fall for this stuff. During these months, the messages show, Sarda repeatedly dangled the promise of money in front of Teradeus. Messages from March 10th, 2018 show the two men discussing a potential transfer of 56 bitcoins, which would be worth just under $525,000 at the time. But when reporters traced the digital wallet Teradeus shared with Sarda, they found that it had received only a single bitcoin, not 56 of them. Teradeus repeatedly asked for updates about additional funds that had been promised to Catalonia. Please tell me when, he wrote, asking whether he had done something to offend Sarda and even offering him cigars. But more than one meeting in Catalonia seemed to fall through, with Sarda simply failing to show up. And imagine maintaining your credibility at that point. Hmm. On one occasion, Sarda sent him a photograph of a suitcase packed with euros, Possibly an attempt to convince the Catalonian that large sums of money were really on offer, as opposed to, like, you know, stock photography. A few days later, although maybe the stock photography was a non-fungible token, and that's how they would make their money. Yeah, that's did it. On one occasion, okay, oh, sends them the, the suitcase packed with money photo. A few days later, the messages show Sarda and Teradeus finally meet up in Barcelona in an apartment, a few hours later, Sarda sent Teradeus a picture, perhaps just taken during their meeting, showing Teradeus holding what appears to be a deposit certificate at the Union Bank of Switzerland worth an astonishing $500 billion. Wow. I wonder if he believed it or whether it was just a joke photo. The exact purpose of the encounter is not clear from the messages, but it's possible Teradeus was meant to show the photo to Puigdemont, or other Catalonian leaders proving, I would say, quote-unquote, proving that the Russian side had access to vast sums of money they had promised. The photo was extracted from the text message logs by reporters. Three specialists who reviewed the purported certificate said it looked like an obvious forgery, noting its poor printing quality as well as spelling and grammar mistakes. The document is 100% worthless, said Daniel uh, Thales. Thelesklaf, or Thelesklaf, former head of the Money Laundering Reporting Office of the Swiss government. Such fakes are often used in scams where people want to show off that they control such assets, and the fake is made very clumsily. When reached by reporters and asked about his relationship with Sarda, Sardarnikov simply uh, described him as a, quote, friend, and said that visiting him was the reason he had come to Catalonia, Asked about the money, Sadovnikov replied, Do you know what $500 billion is? That's practically the budget of the Russian state. 
and someone's going to give the budget of the Russian state to Catalonia. Well, you know, it's not even absurd. It's just, you know, crazy. And I agree, it certainly does sound a little crazy. All right, that's the end of this section. We move on, although the music is about to begin. Uh, on Red Square, the next section, we can at least begin. On searching Sadovnikov's name in corporate records, reporters came across several firms in Russia. It's unclear whether these companies ever conducted any actual business, but they appear to link him to the Russian government and to Italian bankers accused of fraud. So that's a taste of what comes up next. Uh, let me just scan through this. It looks like we actually may finish this up in the next segment and possibly get on to some other things. I just thought this made a great Friday long read. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, the same guy who was just talking to you a second ago. Our Patreon subscription drive is still going strong with over 175 monthly donors who help keep us on the air. If we've helped keep you going during the pandemic, why not return the favor and help us keep going so we can all be together for the next disaster? Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it easy to make secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. Maybe you'd like to thank us for keeping you sane during the Trump era. Maybe you're looking forward to in-depth explanations of what's going on in the Biden administration. Whatever it is that keeps you listening, we need your help to keep bringing it to you. And hey, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running with those options too. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We literally could not do this without you. All right, welcome back now to the Kegel in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. This is it. Uh, we've come to the end of the thing, so no decision to be made. We can just plow through this last section, which will wrap it up and give us a few more names to put on the radar, plus all this to think about. Uh, they searched Sadovnikov's name, of course, in corporate records and came across several firms in Russia. Unclear whether those companies ever conducted any actual business but they appear to link him to the Russian government and to Italian bankers accused of fraud. Again, a little bit uh, like uh, Parnas and Fruman, but uh, uh, at a much higher level, apparently. In Russia, Sadovnikov was a shareholder in four companies incorporated in 2004 and 2005 that had an unusual place of registration, Five Red Square. This is the address in the heart of Moscow of the Middle Trading Rows, a historic complex of buildings that was then owned by the Ministry of Defense. The significance of the connection, if any, is unclear. The firms were struck off the company registry at various points between 2011 and 2017. One of the companies, uh, Onava Energy, oh, energy. See, his fellow shareholders in Onava Energy were Ottavio A. Angiotti and Antonio Mario Angiotti, A N, or perhaps Angotti. Uh, there's no I here. So A N G O T T A I, A N G O T T A, Angotti, as opposed to Angiotti. These appear to be the same father and son Italian bankers whose names were splashed across the pages of U.S. newspapers in the 1990s. I don't remember that, but okay. After they were prosecuted over their roles in the collapse of a bank-like institution, or a collapse of bank-like institutions, known as thrifts. I think we all remember the SNL uh, collapse and bailout and scam, and all the people who got caught up in it, and several of the people who got caught up in it, going on to glorious political careers nonetheless, like John McCain, but whatever. The elder Angotti fled the U.S. after being dropped off at a cancer clinic in 1993 ahead of his sentencing and vanished only to be arrested three years later in Hong Kong. He died in 2009. How do you like that, though? They were about to, they sentenced him. They said, we're going to send you to prison right after your sentencing. He said, oh, I'm old. I'm sick. I got cancer. Let me get my last cancer treatment before going in. Sure, go ahead. You're not going to flee the country or anything. Right, I'm not. Zoom. He does flee and uh, is lost for three years before finally being found and arrested in Hong Kong. Yeah, very savory. In 
1995, his son Antonio was sentenced to 41 months in prison for money laundering. That's never a part of these discussions, is it? And fraud. Six years later, operating under the alias Tony Masse, M-A-S-S-E-I, he fled Estonia, where he was part of a group that fabricated a financial backer to win a large railway privatization contract. By the way, how did the, uh, we've discussed before, how did the oligarchs of Russia become oligarchs? Uh, privatization contracts. Uh, how did they get together the money after a post-communist, you know, having just been communists the week before? How did they get the money to purchase these things, to privatize them? And we discussed in the past, maybe they got it, maybe they didn't. They just said they had it. And what they did have, they used to bribe the guy who signs the papers that say, this now belongs to you. Then they don't come up with the money. And if anybody asks, well, we really need to have that money, give me the money, they say, what if we murder you instead? And then they say, what if I stop asking for the money? And then this guy just owns the railroad and becomes rich because the, the railroad's still working. People are still buying tickets. All the money flows to this guy. Poof, you're an oligarch. That's how it works, in case you didn't figure it out. All right. So uh, where were we with this one? Oh, yes, right. So Tony, uh, operating under the alias of Tony Massey, he fled Estonia after this scam. Today, he's listed on LinkedIn, believe it or not, as working in the energy business in Hong Kong. He, like, he doesn't even know how to hide. Like, where, where would this guy go? Have we tried Hong Kong where he arrested his father? No, I haven't. But, I mean, there's a lot of people in Hong Kong. Have you tried looking at energy consultants like his father said he was? No. Good point. Maybe I will. Oh, look, here he is. Listed on LinkedIn. I was working in the energy business in Hong Kong. It might be the case, just everybody, if you guys are dissatisfied with whatever you're doing for a living, not paying you enough, you might just be able to do this and get away with it. I mean, they did catch these guys, but I imagine that they don't catch a lot of other guys. And they, they caught Lev Parnas, they caught Igor Fruman, but are they in jail? Did they just switch alliance, switch allegiances, and now everybody's like, oh, they're going to sink Trump. They're good guys now. Just do this. I don't know. Anyway, how and why the Angotis got tangled up with Sadovnikov remains a mystery, except, you know, they're in the mafia, he's in the, you know, they're in the, the, the Italian mafia, he's in the Russian mafia. They said, we should mafia together, you and I. Let's do some crimes. Okay. But it remains a mystery. We don't know where they discussed this. When reached by reporters, Sadovnikov denied ever owning companies at all though he mentioned that someone had once opened firms fraudulently using his name. He also flatly denied ever having worked for the Russian state, as, and he stood by his story that he was just another tourist drawn to Barcelona for tapas and tourism. My goal was just to be by the sea, to go swimming, to sunbathe, he said, and that's basically all. That was the purpose of my trip. I don't know anything about these international intrigues. My goodness. And that's all you have to say. I don't recall, or I think that's wrong, or somebody else did it fraudulently. I didn't tweet that. Somebody else must have. It's a fake, fake news. Goodbye. I got to leave. And I guess, I guess it just works, at least for a while. They never arrested any of these guys. They never arrest any of, uh, or I guess they're now beginning to arrest some of the Trump associates. But I don't know. This reminds me more of the, uh, what's his name? Paolo Zampoli, or whatever his name is, that uh, operated in the Trump circles prior to his presidency, back in the days, in the 90s, when they all owned their own modeling agencies and made various uses of them to traffic in women, just like, and girls, just like they accuse everybody else of doing now. It's weird how that happens. All right, well, anyway, that's kind of big and a big piece of background, but just, you know, by way of discussing um, or backing up my constant allegation that Russia isn't a government and doesn't have a government, it just has a mafia, and that's it. I just thought I would add that to the picture. Uh, important update on news that will make you uh, annoyed or sad. Daily Beast piece that I have had in pocket for a couple of days, I guess published May 6th. Representative Marjorie Trader Green allowed to run again for office, judge rules, in case you were wondering what was going to be the outcome of that weird thing we all watched on TV. I think we all knew it wasn't going to go anywhere. But it was fun to watch, nonetheless. Justin Rorlich reporting this for the Daily Beast. Uh, MTG can run again for elected office. A Georgia judge ruled 
last Friday, I guess, dismissing arguments from a group of private citizens who sought to bar her from serving for violating her oath of office based on her alleged participation in the Capitol riot on January 6th. Judge Charles uh, Baudrot, Baud- Baudreau, Baud- I don't know how he pronounces it, B-E-A-U-D-R-O-T, that was the judge, said in a 19-page ruling that the challengers have produced insufficient evidence to show Representative Green, quote, engaged in that insurrection after she took the oath of office on January 3rd. However, the final decision now rests with Brad Raffensperger, Georgia's Republican Secretary of State. Green urged, encouraged, and helped facilitate violent resistance to our own government, our democracy, and our Constitution, argued Ron Fine, a lawyer for the voters who filed the challenge, concluding she engaged in insurrection. But that's just his conclusion. The judge here says, no, but like that's just his rec. That's like your recommendation, man. And it goes to Brad Raffensperger, who, okay, come on, what's he going to say? No, of course. All right, so she'll be back on the ballot. If anybody really thought that was going to work, uh, it didn't. And we really shouldn't have believed that it did, but it was just fun to have the hearing more than anything else. All right, let's see. Other things to uh, discuss with you. Oh, you know, I really kind of did want to get back to the rest of that Cory Doctorow article about um uh what was it that we were talking about the um well if i open it up then i'll probably be able to remind myself oh yes right the change in antitrust law uh driven by um robert bork back in the day uh because there was a recovery from this terrible situation i i I was most interested in the transition and the setup uh how bork and Henry Manny and the um, law and economics seminars made it possible to simply say, we forget what antitrust is. We just are going to redefine it as something completely different. Uh, not unlike how uh, um, John Eastman said, we're just going to redefine what math is used to tabulate votes and use that to declare a different winner than the one that the normal method of counting up all the votes and seeing who got the most would go to. Well, anyway, there was some light at the end of the tunnel, which was a big part of the Dr. O piece, which we didn't get to. Um, where did we leave off? We had just been, uh, we had just been explaining how it was that they got the judicial system to change its mind about what antitrust meant. Not only were there, you know, law professors preaching to students and law professors preaching on weekends at exclusive resorts to federal judges that there was such a thing as an efficient monopoly and that such monopolies ought not to be subject to antitrust law. But in addition to that, um, when, you know, there was a whole mechanism set up. So when a company was accused of violating antitrust law, you could come to the University of Chicago and get an economist from the very prestigious University of Chicago to come in as an expert witness and say, no, 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 this is one of those things that they refer to as an efficient monopoly. And consumers are going to do better under this existing monopoly than they would do if you break it up. And, you know, judges mostly don't know about this stuff. But if there's an expert who presents this, they say, "Eh, who am I to question an expert? Well, we'll admit it as evidence. And the jury says, I don't know anything about it either. An economist says it's okay, And the judge says it's okay to find that even though it looks like a monopoly that we learned about in school, it's okay to let it go because it's good for everybody. So we will. So uh, as they say here, As Cory Doctorow points out, after Bork, the only people whose input mattered was Chicago-style economists whose mathematical models couldn't be interrogated by lay people. They became court sorcerers to the competition regulators. When petitioners came before a regulator, they would slaughter a goat, you know, read the steaming entrails and say, consumer welfare is doing fine. And if you disputed it, they'd say, well, who the hell are you? So for 40 years, antitrust has been in a coma sleeping while monopolies formed in every sector, destroying our planet, our regulatory integrity, our national prosperity, the public safety, and the confidence of people in their democracies. Again, that comes up. But as Stein's law has it, if something cannot go on forever, it will stop. That's a good law. Something has to give. 
a new crop of Neo Brandeisians, Brandeisians, Brandeis, Louis Brandeis, Brandeisians, lawyers, economists, activists, workers has sprouted, insisting that Bork's ideas have failed us and that they need to be set aside. Uh, one of the most prominent of these is Linda Kahn, K-H-A-N, Kahn. Today, Kahn is, you'll never guess, the chair of the Federal Trade Commission. Isn't that good news? That's the light at the end of the tunnel. Five years ago, she was a third-year law student, believe it or not, whose landmark law review article, Amazon's Antitrust Paradox, was a scorching indictment of Bork that tore through legal circles and upended orthodoxy. And it is linked here in at the Yale Law Journal, if you'd like to read it. Khan hasn't been shy about her plans to restore American antitrust to its roots as a doctrine of economic liberty in which, <laughs> believe it or not, in which workers and small business people do not have the course of their lives determined by Sherman's autocrats of trade. She and other top Biden antitrust enforcers, Tim Wu in the White House, Jonathan Cantor at the DOJ worked to produce the Biden executive order on antitrust, a genuine landmark document specifying dozens of specific actions that the administration would take to blunt corporate power. I didn't even know that much about that. Less than a year on, they've hit every milestone in that document. The document is linked here, too, if you want to take a look at it. In January, the Federal Trade Commission and DOJ announced that they would be reviewing the agency's merger guidelines again, something that sounds like business as usual to a layperson, but really marks an enormous shift in American politics. The new guidelines will make it much harder for big companies to grow by merging with each other or gobbling up little businesses before they can become competitors, uh, which... I guess maybe is bad news for people who are looking to become instant billionaires just in terms of use the the uh the big the leading model for the last you know decade or so which has been start up something and that that uh poses a natural competition to something gigantic perhaps and your exit plan is always to be bought out by the biggies by Google by um I don't know, whatever, Netflix, by uh, Microsoft, by Facebook, something like that, um, which is interesting. And I'm sure that's what the Chicago economists are saying. Oh, you're, you're destroying the ability of small businesses to strike it rich. But we'll see whether that flies in the face of reviving antitrust. So and now there's this week's hearings, which I guess were probably last week, in which the FTC and DOJ will hear from who uh, have, I guess, hear from people who have experienced firsthand the effects of mergers and acquisitions beyond antitrust experts, including consumers, workers, entrepreneurs, startups, farmers, investors, and independent businesses. With the exception of consumers, these are people who for 40 years have been laughed out of the room by antitrust enforcers. The people who have been told that they have nothing to say when it comes to the way that giant corporations undermine our quality of life freedom of action, and economic chances. This may sound like normal activity for a competition regulator, because it should be normal, but this is extraordinary. For the first time in a generation and a half, in 10 presidential administrations, in fact, everyday people will get a say on whether corporate power should be blunted. This is huge. And that is the conclusion of the Cory Doctorow piece about that. So I thought I would at least give you the light at the end of the tunnel of that depressing thing from, I guess we must have used it last, was it, did we do it Tuesday or what? I guess so. Maybe it was last week. I don't know. But uh, we've had many comments about the darkness of the show. And uh, today's uh, organized crime news probably didn't help. But uh, there was light at the end of the tunnel of Cory Doctorow's piece. Uh, probably none at the end of what's going on article-wise over at Mother Jones, where they're talking about private equity. Um, I don't know whether that's something that we can actually shoehorn in today, but perhaps uh, next Friday we can begin reading on that. It'll be almost time for a new edition of the magazine by that point. All right, other things to get to. Gosh, there's a lot. Um, let's do this one. This one brought to my attention... By whom? Oh, I don't remember. But uh, I wish I had saved it so that I could 
share it. Oh, maybe I did. Huh. What do you know? I did. Okay. And then I can share not only this thread, but the article that the thread is based on because it's hot right now. Let's end with this. I think this will probably take us to the finish of today unless we just do the thread and leave you to read the article and try to squeeze something else in. Mo, uh, what? Tachik? How would you pronounce this? M-O-E, Mo, M-O-E. I'm not sure uh, what that's short for, but uh, this appears to be uh, a woman going by the name of Mo here. Tachik, T-K-A-C-I-K. T-K-A-C-I-K. I don't know, but she does, and that's the important part. Anyway, Uh, More important, actually, than that is what she has to say. So, she begins. The origin of the baby formula apocalypse. I don't know if I'm going to adopt that name or not. What was it? How did it come about? Uh, Well, it was Abbott Management's, and by the way, Abbott, yes, Abbott Labs, the people who make the uh, rapid COVID tests. Yes, except this is their arm of Abbott Nutrition. Remember, they're making baby formula. So here's the long and short of it. The origin of the baby formula apocalypse was Abbott Management's refusal to repair dilapidated and failure-prone drying machines. The machines, I guess, that turn the formula into powder, right, for sale. Turning the plant into a proverbial, or into proverbial petri dishes for chronobacter, like bacteria, bacteria, chronobacteria. That's, it just sort of ends at the R for reasons unknown, but I guess that's how they refer to it. Because why didn't they fix these drying machines that were causing this baby formula to become contaminated? Because they needed that $5.73 billion for stock buybacks, obviously. Oh, they needed to make themselves rich. Yes. Uh, so highlights that they're calling out from the article on the subject uh include uh parallels as she says she makes a parallel with the boeing murders as she calls them of course the deaths caused by the crashes of their 737 max uh fleet right parallels with the boeing murders are too numerous to list but as you can imagine total breakdown in basic quality control protocols rampant record falsification fired whistleblowers culture of insouciance regarding duping regulators who themselves did not exactly display a sense of urgency here the other big boeing parallel two companies control 80 percent of the market for an absolutely essential product but of course airplanes have like a million parts so yeah not so many companies can do that but with baby formula the only excuse for that degree of concentration is as she puts it mafia s the mafia and s are back in the news again. Might as well also bring up this classy move. Uh, Abbott Labs laying off 2,000 assembly plant workers with a couple of days notice last summer when demand for their rapid test kits diminished, but that's neither here nor there. By the way, the source of this information is Food Safety News, an awesome resource that appears to have been following the story for years. Um, But hey, how about it? You want to look at the Food Safety News reporting on this to get the factual background of what's going on i've seen more than one person now lately talking about this but uh should be a hot topic for a weekend discussion if you're talking with anybody about it former employee blows the whistle on baby formula production plant tied to outbreak don't forget uh yes there are republicans now running around saying oh biden is to blame for the shortage because his fda shut down the factory that makes so much of this baby formula. Well, of course, it was shut down because it was making poisonous formula that was killing babies. So yeah, you kind of want to take care of that. But by the way, killing babies, as it turns out, actually a national pastime for Republicans, except when they're enforcing their will when it comes to abortion. But then again, what are you going to do? Call them hypocrites? They're going to laugh in your face and say, I win. Right. What am I referring to, by the way? I'm sure you've seen the uh, press release from Texas Governor Greg Abbott also taking Biden to task. And now he's been joined by Jesse Waters at uh, what say Waters or Waters Waters. I don't even know how you pronounce it. Who cares? That guy's a jerk. He's on Fox News. He too. Both of them bashing Biden because 
With a national shortage of baby formula out there, Americans are struggling to get a hold of the formula they need for their kids, and they're providing it to detainees at the border. Illegal immigrants, as they like to scream when they talk about them, are getting this baby formula rather than good old American red-blooded babies. Of course, they just told you like last week or something that there was something, something, blah, blah, blah. doesn't matter. We have to make some hard choices maybe about abortion because babies are innocent and you can't punish them for da, 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 unless they're Mexican or Guatemalan, in which case, you know, brown of any sort and punish them. They're actually saying, yes, you should starve these babies to death so that American babies can have the formula. It's a little harder to get alternatives to formula if there are any when you're imprisoned at the border than it is for Americans to, I mean, it's tough and people are having to drive miles and sometimes they're just not getting it. And they're really in a bind about what to do for their babies. But I mean, to say, yes, we should fix this problem by starving Mexican infants. I mean, I don't know what to tell you. It's like they're apartment shopping in hell, these two guys. And yes, by the way, the Lake of Fire is wheelchair accessible, Greg Abbott. You may find yourself there eventually if you're a big believer. And I'm not, you know, there's no real framework for that for me and Judaism necessarily. But Greg Abbott is Catholic. And by the way, under normal circumstances, I mean, I don't make the calls for Catholics, but if there were consistency and why bother thinking about that, good luck getting communion when you put out a press release saying we should be starving, by the way, other Catholic babies to death. But you know what? They're going to give it to you. There are going to be people out there saying Joe Biden can't have communion when he goes to church on Sunday because he thinks it should be other people's choices to what to do. But Greg Abbott is going to get communion if he goes to church. Who knows whether he goes to church? He is Catholic, according to Wikipedia. He gets to have communion, even though it's his public position that we should be starving babies to death. All right. But back to the other thing about why there is the shortage. A whistleblower document regarding product safety at a plant that manufactured infant formula linked to a deadly ongoing outbreak provides damning information against Abbott Nutrition, the maker of Similac and other popular formulas that have been recalled in relation to the outbreak. This is from back in late April of this year. The document sent to top officials at the Food and Drug Administration in October of 2021 sparked outrage from U.S. Representative Rosa DeLauro, who has already demanded information from the FDA regarding the chronobacter, there it is again, outbreak among babies. DeLauro of Connecticut on April 28th shared a redacted version of the whistleblower complaint and renewed her criticism of FDA and Abbott Nutrition for their slow response to the outbreak in which at least four babies have been hospitalized with two having died. I am, of course, deeply concerned about the practices at this Abbott facility and their apparent failure to implement and enforce internal controls at this facility. We need to know exactly who in a company was aware of this failure and the alleged attempts to hide this information from the FDA, DeLauro said, during a meeting of the fiscal on the fiscal year 2023 budget request for the USDA. I'm equally concerned that the FDA redacted far too slowly, reacted, sorry, on this report. The report was submitted to the FDA in October of 2021. The FDA did not interview the whistleblower until December According to news reports, the FDA did not inspect the plant in person until January, late January at that, and the recall was not issued until mid-February. The FDA has found five strains of chronobacter in the Sturgis facility, and that made me panic. You're Sturgis? You're kidding me. They make this stuff in Sturgis, but it's Sturgis, Michigan. I didn't know there was more than one Sturgis. But anyway, none match the outbreak strain, which is a little odd. The discovery of the five types of chronobacter does, however, suggest an ongoing problem at the facility and not just a single incident. Information in the confidential whistleblower document was provided by a former employee who worked in the production plant in Quality Systems, a subunit of the Quality Assurance Organization in Sturgis, as part of Abbott Nutritional's Abbott's uh, Nutritional Division. The whistleblower document outlines many problems at the Abbott production facilities in Sturgis, including... The falsification of records, I'll just read you the top lines on these, releasing untested infant formula, they just said stop testing, and the 2019 FDA audit apparently of the plant was problematic as well, a clean in place staffing and practices procedures, failure to take corrective measures, 
and lack of traceability. The disclosure document was sent to top food and safety food safety officials and other leaders at FDA in October. They included the FDA's top official, then acting commissioner Janet Woodcock, Susan Main, director of the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition, Judy McMeekin, associate commissioner for regulatory affairs, and Catherine Hermson, assistant commissioner of the agency's Office of Criminal Investigations. The document was apparently not sent to FDA's deputy director for food safety concerns, Frank Yanis. Well, at any rate, I can only tell you this. There was a lot of women's names in that list. I don't know whether that was anything weird, but uh, you'd think that they'd be more concerned about these things. Lots of concerns raised in this document, most of which were outlined in the tweet thread, but I'll send you along all these links so that you can read the damning report for yourself. Well, lots more to get to. Plenty left for Monday and next week, of course. And uh, lots that we'll be talking about on Twitter over the weekend. And for now, of course, Justice Putnam gets his bite at the apple of the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Coming up next, we'll see what stories rise to the top for him. After this, I'll try and cram a few mentions in. From NetWordsRadio.com You have been listening to KGRO in the morning with David Walton. Ah, yes, on a related note, uh, Trump officials and meat processors apparently worked closely to keep plants open in the first year of the pandemic, even though they knew workers were rapidly getting infected. And not only that, but the documents and evidence show that the meat shortage they use as an excuse was false. 